we're just going to go through, um, as the title says, the basics that aren't so basic. So you're kind of A to Z on TPRs. And we put some medical terminology in there too. Um, we've given you guys all a handout with some other medical terminology that we use in our practice quite often. But once again, if there's anything that we don't make clear enough or you don't understand, please just let us know and we can, we can go through it all. Cool. Um, so what is the definition of a TPR? Is it total physical response, temperature, pulse, respiratory, or taking personal responsibility? So all of these three can be the correct definition, especially because it is our responsibility as veterinary nurses uh, to create the baseline TPR for all of our patients that walk through those doors. So the baseline TPR of our patients, are, it's crucial as it allows us to see the normal parameters of the patient when they first present to the clinic. Abnormal parameters can give us an insight to what potentially could be going wrong, uh, which also allows us to start a diagnostic workup based on those results. Um, obtaining our baseline TPR can also help us identify any changes or reactions to either medication, parental drug administration, or intravenous fluid therapy throughout future observations. Um, so terminology, so medical terminology just ensures consistent and common um, communication throughout the hospital. So I do think it's beneficial for nurses to have a level of understanding with regards to some medical terminology. I think it will help in the practice when vets and doctors are speaking about a certain thing and you can kind of have some understanding, I guess, as to what they're speaking about. So hopefully some of this can help define that for you guys. Um, so what is a TPR? So the TPR generally consists of the patient's demeanor, uh, patient's heart rates, your respiratory rate, mucous membranes, capillary refill time, and the temperature. So we generally um, do these in a certain order to prevent creating a high heart rate or a high respiratory rate unnecessarily. If your patient is presented to the hospital and they are anxious and stressed, it's definitely beneficial to pop them in a kennel, let them relax prior to doing a TPR, and then you can perform the TPR from the kennel door. This will ensure that you get a, a normal respiratory rate as opposed to a stress-induced respiratory rate. And certainly with regards to demeanor, you can get a bit more of an accurate representation of the demeanor of the patient. Obviously, we're putting them into unfamiliar areas. They, you know, they are going to be stressed to some level, so that's something that we need to consider as well with regards to the TPR. Um, there are many different demeanors that you can come across during the patient upon presentation to the hospital. So obviously dogs and cats have their flight or fight response. So they are generally going to have this, the majority of them is when they do come into the clinic because they are unfamiliar with their surroundings. Um, so your bright, alert and responsive is often what we see and we can make note of. Quiet, alert and responsive. Anxiety, so why could they be anxious? Could they be presented in pain? Could they um, benefit from chemical restraint? I think that's definitely something that we, we can do to help our patients in hospital. Certainly if something is extremely stressed, it's nice to kind of provide something in order to help them whilst they are in hospital. Then they have a better um, understanding of why they're there and if they do come back, they don't remember the negative times in hospital. Aggression, we obviously see this quite often too. I guess that's something that also ties into potentially using chemical restraint if you can. Um, and then if patients are sedated. So certainly if you're doing post-anesthesia TPRs, you're monitoring patients after procedures, whether they're sedated is important. This can kind of go back to your vets and you can let them know whether you think they're too sedated or they've recovered well. So that's definitely worth considering also. Yeah, good job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you want me to just go respiratory? Yeah, can you do that one? Yeah. Um, so we'll now move on to the um, respiration, but before we do that, we'll briefly touch on the respiratory system um, and what it's made up of. So the respiratory system comprises of the nose, the pharynx, the larynx, the trachea. Sorry, where are you going? I lost size. <laughs> <laughs> um, the bronchi, the lungs, and the diaphragm. So the function of the respiratory system is to support the passage of oxygen into the body and carbon dioxide out of the body. Um, so first up, we've got the pharynx. So the pharynx is divided by the soft palate into the nasopharynx, which is, uh, it connects to the cordal nasal cavities. The oropharynx is the second half of the pharynx, which is connected to the cordal 
oral cavity. Um, next we have the larynx. So this is a collective of cartilage such as the epiglottis, the thyroid, the retinoid and the cricoid. So the, so the purpose of the larynx is to prevent foreign body materials from entering the respiratory tract um, during swallowing. To help regulate the flow of gases into, uh, it also helps to regulate the flow of gases into the respiratory tract and contributes to vocalization. And this is what covers the trachea. So you'll notice when you do, do, um, when you do intubate, this is what you press down with the end of tracheal tube. Um, lastly, of the upper respiratory tract, we have the trachea. This is made up of incomplete C-shaped cartilage rings that are easily felt on palpation. It is connected by fibrous connective tissue, smooth muscle, and the ciliated epith epithelium. So the function of the trachea is to allow the flow of oxygen um, from the larynx into the lungs. Um, so now we'll just move on to the lower respiratory system just briefly. So you've got your, as you can see from the image there, you've got your trachea that goes down into your bronchial, your bronchi, your bronchial, and your alveoli. So your alveoli are the tree-like structures which you can see in the image here. Um, and they are the last part of the lower respiratory system. So this is where the gaseous exchange takes place specifically. So this is where your oxygen and your carbon dioxide is mixed basically. And some of it's taken out and some of it's brought in and distributed amongst the tissues. Um, then you obviously have your lungs. So you've got your four lungs, your four lobes on your right side and two on your left side of the body. Um, and I think it's worth just thinking about with talking about medical terminology there might be a term called atelectasis, which maybe some of you have or haven't heard. So that is related to collapse of the lung. So it can be partial or full collapse of the lung. And that can affect your patient's gaseous exchange. So if that happens, then you have to be aware that that exchange, especially during anesthesia, might not happen as well as it should. Um, this can take hours to days to, to, to change, to go back to normal again. And it's definitely something to consider if you've got your recumbent patients or your patients that are under anesthesia for a long period of time in a certain position, as this is likely to happen. So I guess it's just something to be aware of with regards to medical terms. And if you've heard that word thrown around, that's what that word means. So you've got your, the lungs, which are situated within the thoracic cavity on either side of the mediastinum. And... So inspiration, obviously expiration is what happens. Generally, that's what the lungs are there for. So your inspiration is your active and then your expiration is your passive. Um, yeah. Um, so just briefly, we will show you the um, upper airways of a brachiocephalic. Um, so you'll be able to see how much more narrow it is compared to uh, a normal patient that you'll be able to see. Um, this is also why we predominantly see them for upper respiratory tract um, diseases and complications. Um, and you'll notice that when you are doing intubation of the brachycephalic patient, you will most likely need a number of tubes because you just don't know what, which one will fit. Um, so the respiratory rate, uh, this can be either counted on the inspiration or expiration. The common abbreviation that we do use in clinic is the um, RR. So the depth of the respiration also needs to be assessed. Um, so this indicates the amount of air that's been inspired into the lungs. The normal reference range for a dog is about 10 to 30 breaths per minute um, and about 20 to 30 for a cat. Um, and of course, both of these um, reference ranges depend on the physiology of the patient and any excitement or stress. Um, so to calculate the respiratory rate, it is generally counted in a 15 second period. Um, the number that you get in that 15 second period, you uh, times by four to get that um, whole 60 seconds. So the example that we have is 11 breaths were counted in the 15 seconds. So 15 times four um, to make up the 60 is 44 beats per minute, breaths per minute. Um, so we'll just move on to some medical terms with regards to respiration. So we've got um, tachypnea. So tachypnea is an increased respiratory rate. So can anyone give me any examples of why your patient might have an increased respiratory rate? Stress, yep. So say that again. Yep, absolutely, yep. Any other? So you could have patients that have cardiac problems too, um, patients that are in pain, are stressed, absolutely. 
Um, so yeah, there are, there are many different types that you know, obviously you can have that for. You've also got your bradypnea, so this is your slow respiratory rate. Can anyone give me any examples of why a patient might have an abnormally slow respiratory rate in hospital or out of hospital? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Hypoxia, so that can mean low oxygen in the body. Um, so yeah, there are all reasons also. Your dyspnea, which is your difficulty in breathing. So this, I guess, in a way relates to your tachypnea and bradypnea. So if they have difficulty breathing, there's probably an underlying condition as to why. They could have a tracheal stricture. They could have um, a foreign body. They could have lung problems. So these are all possibilities as well. Your apnea, which is complete cessation of breathing. So this could be induced due to drugs. Certainly when you do induce your patient for anesthesia, certain drugs can cause apnea. Um, but I guess under that situation, you can be prepared to obviously correct that with regards to your um, respiratory um, equipment that you have there. Um, so Sturter and Strider, uh, they are both seen mainly with brachycephalic patients. So your Sturter is your low-pitched inspiratory snore and your Strider is your high-pitched wheeze. These are super common and your Sturter is certainly something that people um, hear from their brachies and they, they, they think that it's super cute because they're snoring when it's actually not normal. And then with regards to your Strider, that can indicate that there may be a restricted airflow. So your trachea or somewhere further down could have a restriction there. And that is mainly seen in your brachycephalic patients. So we just briefly discussed tachypnea, so I've just put a few more reasons here as to why your patient could be tachypneic. And we've got a video here of a tick patient, so you can see their respiratory rate and effort is quite diminished. We'll see if that plays. So this patient um, was in hospital last week and it had a tick and it had bilateral nasal oxygen flow um, because it was hypoxic due to its dyspnea. So this is a patient that we had that did pretty well and actually went home. I don't think the video is going to play. No. Maybe if you press this, does that work? No. Oh, that's a shame because it was. A... Do you know how to play videos, Kim? Do they just play? Oh, did it play? Oh. Thanks. PowerPoint. It's um. You never know if it's going to work. Oh, there we go. Yep. Yeah. So as you can see here. This patient has dyspnea. It's difficulty breathing, and you can see that there's a bit of abdominal movement there as well. Um, so bradypnea is a respiratory rate of less than 10 breaths per minute in dogs and 20 in cats. Um, so this can be also sleep seen in our sleeping or our resting patients. It can also be indicative of a metabolic disorder, um, any poisoning or toxicities, uh, drug reactions, Drugs that can cause a decrease in respiratory rates are our opioids, which is fentanyl, methadone, butorphanol, and buprenorphine. Our benzodiazepines, which uh, is our diazepam, which is most commonly known as Pamlin, or our midazolam. Sedatives such as acepromazine, which is commonly known as ACE or ACP. And A2 agonist drugs, which is known as metatomidine or sometimes Domitor and anti-anxiety uh, anti medications such as trazodone or secondary to muscle fatigue. Um, so just so moving on, we'll discuss dips, dyspnea. So this might require supplemental oxygen, oxygen, which is worth considering if your patient does come into hospital with dyspnea. It's certainly worth considering their stress level as well if you're trying to kind of force, force mask oxygen onto their faces and they do have a high level of stress, then you could make it worse. Um, this is when chemical restraint often comes into play and you can speak to your doctor in charge of the case and kind of explain that you're concerned with their respiratory effort and you think they're having difficulty. So it's worth kind of, if you can, trying to assist in that respect. Um, this can happen from um, thoracic trauma and increased pressure on the diaphragm. So certainly if they do come in in the ECC setting, then that could, they could come in with dyspnea. Um, apnea, as we discussed, is complete cessation of breathing. So often you're in, it's cardiopulmonary arrest or potentially anesthesia related. Cool. 
Um, so next is the heart rate. So the heart is a four-chambered muscular organ. Uh, so this is responsible for pumping blood around the body. The common abbreviation that we do use in the clinic is HR. The four chambers include the right atrium and ventricle and the left atrium and ventricle. Um, so the heart contracts due to electrical activity in the cardiac muscle cells. Any abnormalities of this conduction system can lead to irregularities in the rhythm of the contraction, which is known as arrhythmias. The heart rate, like the respiratory rate, should be monitored over a 60 second period to establish the beats per minute. Once the stethoscope diaphragm is against the chest, we need to move cranially, quarterly and ventrally to ensure that we have covered the base and apex of the heart. We also need to note the rate, the rhythm, intensity and the clarity of the heartbeat. The normal um, parameters for both are dogs is 70 to 140 beats per minute. This will obviously change with the um, size of the breed and cats are 120 to 200 beats per minute. And both of these reference ranges depend on the physiology of the individual patient and any excitement and stress. Um, so moving on from heart rate and rhythm, um, a common thing we might see in hospitals, tachycardia, which is an increased heart rate. So this could obviously be due to stress, pain. Um, they could have something wrong with their metabolism. So that's worth considering also. And if you are concerned about that heart rate, just letting the doctor know. There's also bradycardia, which is a slow heart rate. This could also be due to drugs. Maybe they've had too much drug. Um, maybe they are just generally relaxed or they have a cardiac disorder. So that's worth considering also. And I think I was going to, yeah. What else can cause tachycardia and bradycardia? <laughs> Anyone? Any other suggestions? I quizzed you the other day about this. <laughs> um, when you do take your patient's heart rate, it is beneficial to also take their pulse rate, uh, just to check that they don't have any pulse deficits or there are no abnormalities there as well. And certainly if there is abnormalities, then you can let your doctor know and you can potentially perform an ECG and see if they are the rhythm is the same or if there are any pulse deficits or anything abnormal going on there. Heart rates are important to listen to. They can give an indication of underlying diseases and if further imaging or investigation is required, for example, an echo. Um, and it could definitely alter the drugs that you might use for the procedure or even the procedure completely as to what you might have planned. Um, so types of heart irregularities that you might hear, so heart murmurs, these are most commonly heard and are graded from one to six. Uh, so one is barely audible, this is most commonly missed as we just can't hear it. Two is quite soft, so it's kind of audible but kind of not there. Uh, grade three is intermittently loud, um, this is probably one of the most common that we do see. Four is um, quite loud and we might be able to feel it through the chest. Uh, five, this is very loud and has a palpable thrill. And six, uh, this is also very loud and you can physically feel it through the chest. The other irregularities that you might hear are split heart sounds. So the heartbeat sounds like it is split in half um, and it produces two almost simultaneous sounds. Instead of getting the typical lub-dub that we might hear, we will get either a lub-lub-dub or a lub-dub-dub. Another one is the cardiac, cardiac gallop or a rhythm, and this mimics the sound of a galloping horse. We might also hear muffled heart sounds, so the sound of the heart is not clear um, and is hard to distinguish and can be an indication of thoracic disease and also arrhythmias, so this is an irregularity in the rhythm or the contraction of the heart. Um, so why do we listen to the lungs? So that's also important, important as well when you are performing your patient's TPR, certainly in our setting, because we do get patients that might have underlying lung problems. They might have aspiration pneumonia, they might have crackles, they might have fluid on their lungs. So this is important as well. Um, we just have to ensure um, that if a patient is panting, you just gently put your hand around their muzzle. You just, if possible, want to try and listen as well as you can without creating the patient to get more stressed. 
Uh, this also plays into consideration with regards to listening to patients' heart rates too. I think it's definitely worth if you have someone to help you just to try and keep them as quiet as possible. So you're mainly listening for decreased lung sounds, crackles and wheezes. And these could all indicate there are abnormalities there. And certainly if you're unsure, you can ask for a second opinion from a colleague and just see if they can assist with regards to checking the lung sounds. Um, if, they, if you're listening to cats, obviously they can purr from fear. So it's definitely worth trying to create something to distract them, whether that be putting a tap on, blowing gently on their face, or I know sometimes people kind of put like something that smells different in front of their noses. That can just stop them purring just for a moment, and then you can hopefully get a bit more, um, just be able to listen slightly more, especially with regards to their heart rate, and if they potentially have any murmurs. Um, so the mucous membrane colour, this gives us an insight to the oxygenation status and the perfusion of the tissues. So as, along with assessing the pigment of the mucosa, the amount of saliva present on the gums should also be assessed as this can tell us the hydration status of the patient. Other areas where we can assess um, are the inside of the eyelids, the prep use or the vulva. Um, normal mucous membrane of the gum should be pink in colour and moist to touch. This signifies that the patient's oxygenation status is adequate with a good level of perfusion and is hydrated. Um, cats would generally have a paler pink appearance um, and this is still considered normal. It's important to remember that there are breed specific um, animals such as the chow chow or the Chinese sha pei. Um, they do have pigmented muc mucous membranes which can make it difficult to assess. Also, breeds that tend to have a darker snout are susceptible to the pigmentation difference as well. The common abbreviation that we do uh, use in the clinic is MM. Some abnormalities in the mucous membrane colours that we might see are the pale pink or white. So this means that there is a decrease in the blood flow and a poor perfusion in the tissues. It is common to see this colour in patients that are in shock, uh, have ingested poisons, have ingested poisons, acute anemia from hemorrhage, uh, neoplasia or immune mediated diseases. Yep, um, so there's also some other colors you might see on the screen there. So you've obviously got your pale mucous membranes up there on the left. You have to be aware when you are doing these, when we're checking the capillary refill time, it's not gonna be as reliable because they are so pale. You've got your nice color there at the bottom and then your icteric or jaundice on the top right. So this commonly indicates that the patient might have some kind of underlying liver disease. It could also potentially mean, certainly with your patients that have any immune-mediated blood disorders, for example, immune-mediated um, anemia, if their body is rapidly breaking down their red blood cells, this can create bilirubin as, an, as their byproduct, and that will give also the very yellow highlighted colour in your patient's gums and eyes as well. Um, when you do bloods, if you do a PCV, you will also see that colour potentially in the top of your serum when you're running, running your PCV. So that's worth considering also. With regards to your um, mucous membrane colour, so they just, they just indicate the appropriate circulation of red blood cells and oxygen. So you really do want that nice pink colour. Um, definitely if your patient is presented with a level of tachypnea or dyspnea and you do have pale mucous membranes, that is definitely an indication that you might need to perform a um, pulse oximetry to make sure they have circulating oxygen or you may need to provide them with supplemental oxygen. Um, so that's just worth considering also. And this is a really important part of the, of the TPR. It's certainly an indication with regards to if they are going to surgery, what other blood tests you could perform to give you more indication if they do need any more support during the procedure or post-procedure. So it's definitely really, really important to perform this as part of your TPR. Would you like some water? <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? No? That's okay. So we'll just talk about blood pressure. So obviously blood pressure might not be necessarily part of your, uh, sorry? No, of your TPR, um, but it's certainly something we perform quite often up at NCVS. It's beneficial because it gives you a patient's indication of their kidney um, function and how well they are likely to deal with the anaesthetic that they're going to probably end up having. That's why they're in hospital. So a few medical terms that you might come across is hypotensive or hypotension, which is your low blood pressure. 
normotensive or normotension normal, and hyper is your high blood pressure. So in hospital, patients generally will have a level of hypertension because they do have that stress impacting on their results of their blood pressure. So that's worth considering also. So if you do get those extremely high numbers, obviously let your doctors know, but just be aware that might be contributing to your patient's blood pressure. When you are measuring your, your cuff for your patient's limb, it's important to do 40% of the patient's limb circumference. If you over under, overestimate your cuff, you will get a low reading, and if you underestimate, you'll get a high reading. So just be aware of that, I guess, as to what you have available in your hospital. Um, we very regularly use a Doppler. So although that might seem a bit old school, it's the most accurate way of getting an appropriate blood pressure. Certainly with your small patients, um, your small dogs and your cats, whilst it, can't, it might be quite stressful for them because it is quite noisy, it's definitely the best way to do that. I think it's also worth considering when you are getting that blood pressure in your small patients, it's generally indicating the mean blood pressure as opposed to the systolic. Um, you also have your oscillometric blood pressure monitors, which is the monitors that you all use for anesthesia, and that will give you the systolic, the diastolic, and the mean. So the mean is calculated using the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. So it's really beneficial prior because then you are aware of what you're working with when your patient goes into anesthesia. Certainly, as we see in our hospital, many patients with kidney problems, um, it's very important for us to do this, this in a very stress-free environment, in the consult with the owner, and just to kind of make it a most accurate representation of their blood pressure, um, just so you try not to kind of increase it before you get the result. Um, so moving on to the temperature, so rectal temperatures are preferred and they are the most accurate form to take an animal's temp uh, to ensure for an accurate reading. When we are gently inserting the thermometer, aim to hug the wall of the rectum as the presence of theses can actually give a false low reading. Um, although it is not preferred or as accurate, an auxiliary temperature can be performed on fractious patients or any patients that have had like a hind or rear surgery. Um, the thermometer is placed under the axilla um, and the rule of thumb is to add one degree to your um, final reading. Um, it's worth considering when you are monitoring, monitoring your patient's temperature is whilst we do have a general normal range for dogs and cats, each patient does have a different individual temperature. So the temperature is gauged by your hypothalamus in your brain. So everything as humans will be very slightly different. different. Um, I think it's just important for people to be aware of hypothermia and hyperthermia and how different they are and how much they can impact your patient, especially recovery of anesthesia and during an anesthesia. Um, it's also worth considering the difference between pyrexia and hyperthermia. So your pyrexia is when your hypothalamus has actually reset your body's temperature. So your body thinks it's a lot higher than it should be. And that is probably, it's usually an indication of a systemic disease. These patients, you want to be careful with regards to calling them down actively as you can encourage their hypothalamus to continue to increase because your body keeps thinking that that's the actual normal temperature. Does that make sense? Um, hypothermia, on the other hand, is, is more factored by your temperature outside. So you get your heat strokes, your, patient, your dogs that are being walked during the day. Um, and then that is when the body knows its temperature should be 37.5, 37.8, so it will actively pant and cause vasoconstriction to reduce that body's temperature. So hypothermia is also known as a reduced or lower temperature. And this can be seen in patients with chronic diseases, illnesses, heat loss during anesthesia, um, environmental exposure, or in pediatric patients. Uh, this needs to be corrected with active heating as the drop in core temperature uh, can affect the myocardium, the tissue perfusion, metabolism, and the recovery time. Uh, when a patient is hypothermic, it creates a decrease in cardiac output and the blood pressure causing hypertension. Once the active heating has commenced, uh, the temperature of the patient should be routinely checked every 15 minutes to just make sure we don't cook them. It's important to keep the induction and the recovery rooms at an ambient room temperature, uh, and this will help with the thermoregulating. Some common techniques that we can apply to our everyday uh, nursing routines are pre-warming patients after the pre-medication, 
So a bear hugger, polar fleece blanket or some potties can be used. Uh, keeping anesthesia time kept to a minimum where possible. Using warm saline in surgical preparation or warming our intravenous fluids. So once the body goes below 34 degrees, uh, it can no longer warm itself. So we do need to try and stay above this in anesthesia. Um, it's also worth considering in clinic with regards to your patients that can and can't move around. I know that a lot of people use heat mats and they're fantastic, but we've all probably seen burns here. So it's definitely worth considering the fact that if you have a patient that's non-ambulatory -ambul and we do have to move them around, you can use other ways of heating these patients. Um, and I guess everything we do can cause a level of hypothermia, pre-medication, hospital environment, sterility in the room, cold tables, alcohol. We see it every day, but temperature is really important, so it's definitely something that people need to consider, and you kind of need to beat it before it, the patient gets too cold, so you can try and prevent it from just exacerbating and getting colder. So yeah, I guess, uh, you know, the last slide there we've just kind of written about with regards to pyrexia or hypothermia, so temperatures over this can be detrimental to the patient, um, and they generally do come with pyrexia and, and, and systemic diseases as opposed to an active hypothermia, uh, sorry, a environmental hypothermia. Um, with regards to calling patients, that's definitely under the, veterinary, the, the veterinarian's discretion. I know certainly, depending on the temperature, depends on whether you actively call patients or not, because once again, you could reset that hypothalamus and exacerbate the, the situation. I think that's it. We kind of, thanks guys, I hope that was okay.